So this is going to be a solo podcast. And I'm going to follow up on a few ideas from the previous podcast where we were talking about rubbernecking. So if you recall from the last podcast, or which if you're binge watching was a previous ev- episode just a little while ago, or if you're following this on release time, probably a week ago, uh, Mike was talking about telling people just to move in the supermarket. So he's expressing their frustration with a bottleneck from people who are, for whatever reason, taking up space, taking too long to make decisions or having different purposes at being in the context. It kind of annoys me too, you know, when you go to a place or a function and there's always some dickhead who wants to impose their uh, model of the world on things and wants to use the function or the place for a purpose for which it's not really designed. I mean, yeah, it can do with a bit of modification, but the majority of people are there to have a, a swim in a swimming pool and this arsehole wants to put his canoe in there. Or it's the vegans who make a protest um, at a restaurant that serves beef. You know, it's not going to sway people. In fact, it's probably going to get people to dig their heels in even more. It just creates a disturbance. And I get the reason why, you know, it's to uh, create a disturbance. It's to create notoriety. It's to get on the news and get the message out. I understand. I get it. So this is what we talked about last time. To persuade people, you have to be able to communicate with them. Communication is a two-way thing. So you have to open a dialogue. But before you can do that, you actually have to get people's attention. But to go into the communication phase, you have to understand their epistemology. You have to understand uh, what kind of responses they're going to give you to be able to move forward. Um, But uh, this is the interesting thing. Does it actually change people's minds? So you've got notoriety, you've, you've got on the news, and you're telling your vegan story, which has merits, I'm sure. Uh, I wish sometimes some of the vegans would make uh, better arguments. Um, I hate the one where they say, so oh, it's just because it's murder. Uh, no, it's not, and that's not an argument. So there are merits, and I wish to make the better argument. But this is the whole point of why I wanted to make uh, this standalone podcast, because there's a cost-benefit analysis. You know, what is the cost and the risk of, I don't know, getting arrested or getting bad PR or uh, tarnishing the objective of, uh, you know, what veganism, veganism stands for by uh, basically being, I don't know, publicity terrorists. So is it an optimized solution? And these things have fascinated me from time to time when I've gone to airports and seen the crazy things that they seem to be trying. I remember one time I was at Heathrow, I think it was Heathrow. Uh, or was it Gowick? Oh, I can't remember. Been to both. Uh, might have been. Yeah, I thought I, uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. But um, there was this, uh, they were trialling this thing whereby if you had uh, carry-on luggage that was under a certain weight, then you had to join a different queue. Um, and they asked me to go into a different queue because my carry-on uh, luggage was obviously more. And I thought, well, how will I know until I weigh it? And they said, well, you can go to the back there and weigh it. And I thought, well, if I go to the back there and weigh it, it takes extra time and I'm out of the queue now. So what's the benefit? And so they had me weigh my carry-on bag and it was actually under the limit, but I was carrying four or five lenses in my coat pockets, which I was wearing, which would have put me over. So I wondered what their decision was because they didn't take account of that. It was just the carry-on. And it's not like you're limited in weight by carry-on. The, the, as far as I know, the limiting factor is size. So it just left me bewildered and it, again, kind of erodes my confidence in why they're making these decisions. I'm obviously lacking some information. You know, I'm no expert on airport security or uh, logistics and I always wondered why they fill the plane from the front first, why it makes more sense to actually fill it from the back first. I never really understood that. Uh, Maybe it's me, maybe it's them, maybe there's something I don't know. And this is the story of my life, you know. I think about these things and uh, sometimes conclude, yeah, filling an airplane back to front um, is better than filling it from front to back, just from a logistics point of view. But why do they do that? I don't never understood it. Maybe they do it differently, I don't know. Uh, But other things have puzzled me as well, you know, decisions under uncertainty. 
when we become risk seeking and uh, how to make good decisions. What is a good decision? Uh, is it based on facts, data? Um, is it based on reproducibility? Is it produced on confidence or probabilities? Uh, and uh, the kind of very simplistic risk model of uh, spotting hazards, which we talked about a little bit in the previous podcast. You, you have a hazard that makes a catalyst that results in the concomitant result. And so you, if you have some program or some strategy to be aware of hazards in the marketplace or hazards in life, that has a certain cost because you have to be aware of it. You have to have monitors trying to pick it up or you have to have some apparatus that's sensitive to it. And then you have to have the similar or same kind of apparatus to spot hazards. And then you have to have some way of working out whether they're ever going to meet. And then you have to have a way of working out if they do meet, is it serious or is it expensive or is it trivial uh, or is it impactful but not costly? And then you can formulate your own risk profile and your risk uh, response to risk. In other words, the foundation of insurance, right? Uh, so, you know, the old uh, thing, should I go third party, third party, foreign theft or comprehensive? Well, I don't know. I mean, there's arguments to be made. You might say you're an inexperienced driver, therefore comprehensive makes sense. But because you're inexperienced, that premium will be high. Maybe, you know, is it is it worth it or not? Or if you say, yeah, I'm an experienced driver and the likelihood of me having a crash is very low. However, because you're experienced, you can afford low cost comprehensive insurance. So, you know, which do you do? But then other things factor in. Where do you live? Is it high crime rate? Where do you live? Is it uh, an area well known for uninsured drivers? Or is, um, you know, what's your particular journey profile? And, you know, all the metrics are in. I think they've got it pretty well buttoned down to asking just a few questions now to um, get your risk profile. I don't know, artificial intelligence and risk models, what can I say? But this is their business. And... Um, we should expect that they do it well. So anyway, yeah, following on uh, from Mike's move comment and the knock-on effects of rubbernecking and how rubbernecking actually increases the risk of accidents, which ironically uh, induces more rubbernecking. Uh, the evidence so far, as far as I can tell, shows that on freeways, certainly, rubbernecking is the primary cause of accidents. And so the maths behind it all was fascinating. And what this particular study did that I was reading, it divided up sections of freeway to analyse the change in speed and the change in throughput as rubbernecking incidents occur. And the analysis that they used is something called binary integer programming. And I'm always tickled by mathematics and what it helps us understand. I mean, when I learned... Uh, yeah, I mean, I've done a video on how to calculate pi using Monte Carlo simulations, and it fascinates me. Uh, it fascinates me in, when I was in banking and the math models and the Black Skulls pricing models and how to price options. Uh, it's fascinating to me, endlessly fascinating. You've got time value and intrinsic value, and as you get closer to the call or the option date or the expiry date, Time value erodes, intrinsic value moves with volatility, and what's the optimum uh, price point? And it's, uh, it's f fascinating, fascinating stuff. And I kind of kick myself because back then, you know, I was just going through the motions, not really paying attention to what was going on. And I sometimes wish now, you know, as we can always say, if only I knew then what I know now. So I wanted to take a diversion on BIP or binary integer programming and with the hope that maybe someone will be inspired or maybe we'll get a greater appreciation of governance, corporate governance or even government, country governance and statecraft. And so, you know, I'm a little bit cynical myself with the vested interests that are often found uh, ancillary to politics and how politics sometimes trumps the science that's actually giving good data and good models to make predictions about uh, what may happen in the future given the current circumstances. So maybe I have a naive hope that somewhere someone is inspired to understand or at least become aware of these techniques and that maths isn't always you know, hard and to be frightened of and that it can uh, give us a really good basis for making good decisions and um, 
always inspired by reading books about people who seem to have figured all this out, particularly, for example, Warren Buffett. And he talks about assembling your decision trees ahead of time. He knew that business and finance works on good decisions. Snowball um, by Alice Schroeder was quite a tour de force, a big read. Uh, but actually a better book to get the insights on uh, Warren Buffett is The Real Warren Buffett by L. L- Lachlan. I think it's Lachlan. James O. o- Lachlan. So yeah, create these decision trees. And what he's talking about is a, uh, there's a particular, oh, is it event? What do they call that in finance? Um, event strategies uh, where you can, it's like the game downfall. You know, you plan that if this event happens and that event happens on the back of it and then this event happens, then these are the financial instruments you need to have in play at that given time. And similar kind of thing. So when he talks about decision trees, he's basically saying, you know, have your if, what, when, where and when planned out ahead of time. So that when stock goes up, you do this. When it goes down, you do that. And in balance with all your other uh, stocks. So in other words, you take the emotion out of it. You plan it ahead. You plan, you run the numbers now to know the decisions you'll make that when you start losing a lot of money, you know what your exit points are. And if you've ever done day trading or any kind of trading like that, you know that emotion uh, just fucks it all up for you. I, you almost, you got to, you can't take the emotion out of these kind of decisions. So the best way, the second best alternative, it seems to me, is to make the plan ahead of time. And then when that sticky situation comes, you can say, okay, I made the plan with a cool mind. Therefore, even though I might not agree with it now, I know that that plan was made with a cool mind and I'm under stress right now. So I should probably rely on the good plan that I made when I was in a good mind with good uh, data availability and good visibility and a dispassionate um, process of uh, working these things out. So yeah, there's good insights in that book and Buffett knew and Charlie Munger, of course, knows about the failure of cognition and uh, he wrote about that extensively in his um, speech that he gave to one of the universities, uh, the 25 cognitive biases of Charlie Munger. Might cover that in another video. I think I've already covered it in some of the Facebook videos. Yeah, in fact, I'm pretty sure I did do it um, when I was doing uh, videos on negotiation. The Lollapalooza effect is what he called it. Yeah, so the pair of them know that uh, people make bad decisions or incorrect decisions, especially when under emotional load, because, you know, we're not, you know, we have uh, this emotional thing, we have uh, heuristics and we have guesswork and uh, we have all sorts of cognitive biases and heuristics in our mind that lead us to do counter, well, they seem intuitive at the time and Finance and intuition are seldom aligned, which is kind of funny because a lot of movements in the markets are made by people making irrational decisions all the time, uh, some more than others. So there's always this kind of background noise of irrationality. And, uh, you know, the Elliott wave model tried to appeal to this, um, kind of hum toing and froing of uh, emotional responses and I think the hypothesis was based on the fact that um, because price moves as a consequence of people's emotional outlook then to a certain degree uh, it shouldn't be any surprise that if we can predict what people's emotional responses are to given situations in the market we should expect to see price movements uh, shortly thereafter. So, uh, yeah, I looked at the Elliott wave, you know, I don't know, you know, this is the, the hard thing about testing these things. It's, it's kind of like a self-referencing thing, you know, once you place your bets on the market, you become a market participant. So your participation in it means you're involved in it. And so there's no such thing as a, a control test. So there's no kind of null, null position to take. You're always active in the market. Yeah, yeah, regression analysis and all that. But then, you know, you, again, you, once everybody starts using these strategies like fractal trading, the regression analysis becomes uh, 
weaker because you're looking at a time in the market when people weren't using the trading strategies that they're using today. So I don't know even whether regression analysis, anyway, getting divergent off the uh, topic. Anyway, I saw a brilliant demonstration of uh, this failure in cognition, uh, emotional overload. I was watching the snooker and one of the players got behind by a couple of frames and then seemed to have what you might call perceived bad luck. And you could see the resentment kicking in. You know, he started blaming the table, blaming the cloth, blaming the cue ball, he even picked up the black ball and handed it to the ref to have a look at, which I've never seen in snooker before. Uh, so I knew what was coming. Uh, you know, he the other guy was two frames away from uh, winning the game and so this guy needed to catch up, I think, six frames or something like that. So he needed to at least win. Uh, yeah, well, he could only afford to lose one more frame and the rest he had to win. So, like, uh, I think I asked Mike in one of the podcasts a couple ago, if you start with 100 and you gamble and you lose 50, you're down to 50. What do you need to do to get back to 100? Mike quite correctly said you need 100% gain. And what do you need to do to get 100% gain? Well, it's a, it's a big risk investment. Uh, it's a crapshoot more often than not. Uh, when you go for a 100% investment, it certainly does not come risk-free. And so this is what happens. We start to become risk seeking. And that's what this chap did. You know, you could see there was, uh, there was the break on the next frame. There was a loose red. Normally a professional player wouldn't go for it. Not as such, you know, an early stage in any frame. Uh, but he went for it and it was catastrophic and, um, just let the other player, he missed a shot. The other player got in, cleaned up and, uh, that was it. You know, the next frame, his mental frame had collapsed. Uh, and he, you know, could see he was just going to lose and he did uh, you know because he was trying to get back at the table he's, you know I've seen this in investment as well I'll get back at that stock it's like crazy talk you know blaming the balls blaming the key blaming you know it's um, yeah dangerous it sets up this uh, resentment so yeah I mean I, I actually heard a quite a good saying recently to do with the secret to living a long life is to take steps to prevent it ending shortly and I guess for those interested in looking at uh, how to be successful in trading, there's a good little book. It's only a, it's a fast read, really, really fast read. It's only about 200 pages by Freeman Shaw. It's called The Art of Execution. And it look, I think he looked at, from memory, he looked at fund managers that would, had funds in excess of a billion dollars to manage. And he looked at uh, five different types. Well, he looked at many, many different fund managers and he profiled them. Uh, to different behavioral traits and I can't remember the categories now but I think you had things like um, rabbits um, warriors um, I've actually got the book off the bookshelf we've got uh, rabbits assassins, hunters raiders and connoisseurs and each one has a different profile or different outlook in terms of uh, when to double down or when to cut losses or when to ramp up or when to invest or when to get out. We all have different profiles, different payoff matrices, and there is one clear winner. So I spoil which. It's a pretty good book to get. I'll leave a link in the description. Yeah, I had some videos uh, floating around that I did on that book, but uh, they weren't. Uh, they were not very good. Not that these are brilliant, but uh, yeah, might redo them. Anyway, yeah, grab the book. It's a fast read. Anyway, decision and decision trees, something I always wanted to understand. And there's a everyday simple example. It's the burger and bun conspiracy. And so the bread buns are always sold in packs of six and burgers in packs of four or eight. So we have the problem of two wasted buns, or if we have two packs of burgers, uh, then we have excess number of buns. No problem, you say, let's just double up a couple of those burgers and use the excess burgers and force them into buns so we have double-decker buns. But then then there's a fight at the barbecue for who wants the double-deckers and who wants the single-deckers. 
So then there's another cost to consider the social inequity, the broken etiquette at the barbie. So, okay, we buy two packs of buns and three packs of burgers to make it all work out. Twelve burgers, twelve buns. But we only have eight guests. So again, fights break out about those who want two burgers. Or some burgers go to waste because everyone's being polite. Or we invite more guests. But then we know that some guests are incompatible with other guests. And then we need a bigger barbecue machine to actually be able to cook 12 burgers simultaneously. Because we don't want some waiting, some not. Ah, gosh. So this is the optimization problem. And... Specifically, the optimization problem centers around integral items. I mean, we could do half burgers, but it looks a bit shitty. And to our guests, it just kind of signals our <laughs> incompetence at planning and we suffer reputation and status damage. Uh, but in the business world and so on, for example, we can't do half tellies and half cars. And it's the same with the traffic rubber nepping problem there is either a car that is affected or not. And to some degree, in a specific part of that highway and at specific times. So we can start to see the complexity of the issue. And it's similar to the barbecue problem. How many to invite, who to invite, when, and how many burgers and how many buns. And God forbid, we have to have a vegetarian or vegan option. Not that I've got anything against that. I just don't want proselytizing on the back lawn. So this is the well-known problem in uh, logistics, known as the transportation problem or the backpack problem. What is the optimal decision strategy uh, when concerned with integral items? So, uh, so the backpack problem, roughly stated, is there is a constraint on the backpack of how much weight uh, you can put in it. And then you can put different objects into the backpack that have different volume and different value. So we might imagine a gold brick, very heavy, uh, small volume, very valuable. And then, I don't know, maybe we've got tungsten or silver. It sounded like quite a good backpack all of a sudden. Uh, so the question is, what combination of items uh, can you fit into the backpack, get under the weight constraint, but maintain maximum value. Now, you might not have things as dense as gold. Uh, so the question is, what combination is the optimized one for value whilst coming in at or under the weight constraint? So right of the book on linear programming, these complex undertakings share in common is the task of constructing a statement of actions to be performed their timing and quantity, called a program schedule, that, if implemented, would move the system from a given initial status as much as possible towards some defined goal. The computational task is then to devise for these systems an algorithm for choosing the best schedule of actions from among the possible alternatives. The observation in particular that a number of economic, industrial, financial and military systems can be modelled or reasonably approximated by mathematical systems of linear inequalities and equations has given rise to the development of the linear programming field. Same thing with the barbecue problem, right? What is the optimum number of burgers and buns to buy so everyone has a good time without having excess food or wastage? And I wonder, you know, sometimes, you know, the uh, kind of stereotyped holiday suitcase uh, rammed full of all the stuff that just in case. And I wonder sometimes if a quick probability uh, application wouldn't uh, help people do that kind of packing. Yeah, sure. You need a head. Well, I remember one time there was a, a young woman who uh, lived in the same house as I was at the time and she was leaving the country, flying back home, uh, I believe it was to India. And I noticed that she had about five kilograms of rice in a suitcase. And uh, she was packing everything else around it, and it was getting pretty tight in there. And I asked her what she thought the excess baggage fee was at the airport. And then I asked her, OK, what is the price of rice per kilo? You know what I mean? 
Okay, so maybe uh, you want to take that spare hair dryer and the second set of flip flops. Where are you going? How much do they cost when you buy that? Don't hell to else have them. And I, right, in this day and age, you just phone them up and ask. Yeah, so I don't know whether it's a big problem anymore. I remember going to New York once and I just had a carry on backpack. That was it. It's in and out. No waiting for suitcases. That's the best way to do it. On the other hand, I remember going to Borneo and um, we were at at some little airport, little airstrip, and out in the middle of frigging nowhere. I mean, I remember it was a little Cessna, and we were going on the Cessna, and we were actually going to fly over the rainforest. And uh, they wanted to stand on these scales holding all of our luggage. And I said, are you taking a piss? And they said, no, no, we have to work out exactly how much you weigh with your luggage because it's a light aircraft, and we have to distribute the weight evenly, so we need to know not just the total weight, but the individual weight, so that we can balance the aircraft left to right. I never really thought about it like that. Yeah, it's just pretty fucking scary. And when we're actually flying about 300 feet over the forest below, and you just look down and it's jungle for as far as you can see. Shit. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty awe inspiring. Uh, yeah, same thing with helicopters when I was in Hawaii, um, flying uh, over the big island in helicopter. Same thing. They have to weigh you and uh, allocate. Uh, kind of like a, an even distribution of weights so it's a similar kind of problem where do we sit everybody according to the left right front back weight but also total weight how much fuel do we need to put on board and uh, i also uh, was learning about uh, the problems they have with apache helicopters and um, the a10 so-called i think what do they call it the thunderbolt a10 aircraft it carries about 1200 rounds of ammunition and can fire that, I think, if memory serves, up to 60, 70 rounds a second. Horrible, grotesque machines of war. Um, but as they, I think the A-10 doesn't actually eject um, its projectile casings because it would destabilize the aircraft so much by the loss of weight. So they actually uh, keep the casings uh, within uh, the aircraft. I think there's similar problems on Apache helicopters that uh, either they can only carry so many rounds, not because of the the weight or the lift that can't be produced by the rotors, but because the loss of weight at that um, pivot point destabilizes the uh, whole aircraft. Uh, again, fascinating problems to solve. Yeah, even again on the A-10, the issue of the Gatling gun uh, it produces so much uh, backward recoil force that's almost... Uh, equivalent to the power delivered by the engines so in theory if you fire for long enough um, you'd fall out of the sky of course um, I think they only carry what, 1500 rounds something like that so you could empty the barrel in a few seconds but here again you've got an optimization problem you know loss of speed instability um, effective uh, utility of the gun versus uh, the range or the cost of uh, putting the aircraft in the location and I think it was uh, unique. I don't know whether it's unique. I think it's unique in the fact that uh, also this aircraft has a titanium uh, protective shield around the um, pilot and I believe uh, around the Gatling gun itself as well, adding weight to the aircraft, uh, which also then has impact on performance and fuel efficiency and range. So again, the trade-off, uh, what's more important, uh, survivability or range or speed or economy? Not that I can really imagine that economy of fuel in the military is a, a high priority having said that though i seem to remember somewhere in the past reading about high octane fuel uh, which uh, allowed higher compression ratios uh, a higher efficiency of engines and um, greater range and speed to allied vehicles during world war Two. so yeah um, quite significant Again, it's all supply line issues, it's logistics, it's, it's this uh, transportation problem again. It's knowing the cost structure of your supply lines. Critical, fascinating stuff. So yeah, the, this kind of problem, the knapsack problem or the backpack problem, uh, it's a resource allocation uh, problem. Uh, immediately I think of finance, um, applied mathematics, computer science, combinatorics, um, cryptography um yeah the application is far and wide so yeah uh let's have a crack at one uh, and uh, i might just 
whilst I think about it, put up in the video of the Monte Carlo simulation. It's going to stand out as a sore thumb on the channel because it doesn't really relate to anything, but just for fun. Yeah, so like I say, for some reason, these things really tickle me and uh, it makes maths fun. And so, you know, I really don't like it when people go, oh, oh, oh here's the maths, or skip this bit if you don't like maths, or, oh, you know, don't worry, don't panic, you know, when you see the maths, as if maths is hard or frightening or daunting. I never really understood that. Maths is kind of easy. It's like, all you have to do is follow the rules. Okay, there's lots of them, but what is easier than following rules that someone else has worked out? Uh I might even do a video on calculus now that I think about it. Because when I learned that, it was like an epiphany. And my math sucks. But calculus is just such a a, a beautiful thing. It's just uh, amazing. I, I uh, What a great invention. And this is the thing, though, you know, all our modern communications, those JPEGs we send to each other, use maths, sine waves to do the compression. MP3 audios as well. Um, they fast Fourier transforms. Again, mathematics and the DVD codecs and H uh, two six four compression algorithms. All mathematics. Fascinating stuff. I was even playing with um, some uh, 3D software. The latest release of Blender two point eight uses EV uh, ray tracing. So the the rendering and the ray tracing engine is on a fast computer now, almost real time. You know, uh, back in the days of like uh, Maya 4.5 or Mac Studio 6 or 7, uh, you know, you could be waiting a couple of hours per frame. But now with really good graphics card and this EVE render engine, it's almost real time. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool stuff. And again, you know, they've changed the maths and I think they use a different algorithm for tracing light rays and make different assumptions about... Um, where the light rays can come from, therefore you don't need to compute all that space to get the same result. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating stuff. Clever bastards out there. Yeah, so it's again, um, optimization problems, uh, logistics fascinates me. Uh, you know, how do ports, shipping ports, harbors, train depots work? And how is inventory control significant in corporations and companies and warehousing and yeah, inventory control? great story about how the shipping container made someone very rich because that innovation put the warehouse on the transportation mode that is to say the transportation is the warehouse and then we get into all the JIT planning or just in time planning yeah speaking to a couple of friends that work uh, in the logistics sides of supermarkets yeah they're only a day away from an empty shop but when you go in it always looks full so enough rambling, the transportation problem deals with the distribution of goods from several points of supply, such as factories, often known as sources, to a number of points of demand, such as warehouses or other destinations. So each source is able to supply a fixed number of units of each product, usually called capacity, and each destination has a fixed demand, usually known as demand or requirement. The objective is to schedule shipments from sources to destinations so that the total transport cost is a minimum. So let's not stand on ceremony and crack into an example. So we use the commonly cited example. A concrete company transports concrete from three plants called one, two and three to three construction sites imaginatively named A, B and C. And the plants are able to supply the following numbers of tons per week. Plant 1, 300. Plant 2, 300. Plant 3, only 100. And it's expected the sites have a requirement in number of tons per week. Construction site A requires 200 tons. Site B requires 200 tons. And site C requires 300 tons. So now we can diagram a mapping structure and we can write down the cost of transporting concrete from a particular plant to a particular site. Now in reality this might be because the site happens to be close to the production plant or there may be 
that some production site requires a ferry trip or something that incurs extra expense or it's a toll road, whatever it is. So we can map it out and say that we go from the following plants to the following sites and then we map the routes linearly. So from 1 to ABC, from 2 to ABC, from 3 to ABC and then we can write down some nominal cost of what it takes to move a ton of concrete from that particular plant or production facility to that particular site or warehouse. And we can clean that up a little bit and put it into a table. So here we show the sites and the plants and we go from a plant to a site and we can write in the transportation cost for each route and we can check on the right hand side that we have the correct supply availability and sum that up and it should equal the demand requirement across the bottom summed up and that's a quick check to know that we're working with what's called a balanced model. Now there are occasions where the model is not balanced that is to say either there's too much supply or too much demand so quick question to the audience what do you do when you have too much supply well you create another market you sell it to a, a surplus disposer or you rebrand it or you take out certain guarantees or uh, assurances of product quality and you sell it cheap to a different market where uh, quality of assurance um, or a guarantee of a particular level of quantity or quality isn't required so you can sell it cheaper just to get rid of the surplus rather than it just taking up in um, warehouse space if there's a shortfall in supply uh, or an increase in demand that can't be met then yeah you have to look at buying it in from other parties and putting that into your supply chain and this is one of the great things about business and about paying attention to things it's knowing the cost of your supply chain and that's what this is all about uh, reducing costs or making the supply chains as efficient as possible by working out what is the optimal way to shift things around uh, your particular business ecosystem and then doing it better and at lower cost than the competition so I suppose in one respect the efficient allocation of capital is by competition and in a way if you step back at the entire business ecosystem and not just focus on one individual company in competition with another company the whole enterprise of commerce to me anyway seems to be a competition a cooperative competition to find these most efficient critical paths as it were so before we get into the general solution and a specific solution of this little matrix it's worth mentioning some names since this is uh, under the auspices of deconstructing greatness so we start with a russian mathematician and economist leonid kantorovich he's regarded as the founder of linear programming and i think he won the nobel one of the nobel prizes for his work on linear programming or the optimal allocation of resources. Something again, if you've read Snowball and A Real Warren Buffett, and I think there was another book I read on Buffett. I mean, there's so many of them. But yeah, it's always about resource allocation. And uh, Buffett's formula is motivate people, allocate resources in that order. But if you even think about it, motivating people is an allocation of resource because you have to put something into that to get them motivated so again that really is an allocation of resource a few years later George Danzig independently developed a general linear programming formulation and uh, his application was in the US Air Force and Danzig uh, arranged a meeting with John von Neumann which we should probably mention later on uh, very very bright people and um, they discussed something known as the simplex method and uh, von Neumann was uh, interested in game theory and I think game theory again is a kind of optimization of uh, multi-independent variables 
where is the sweet spot? Where is the optimal position? What is the best response? Uh, I don't know whether that directly relates to Nash equilibrium. Uh, so Danzig's original example was to find the best assignment of 70 people to 70 jobs and the computing power required to test all permutationers to select the best assignment is vast because the number of possible configurations exceeds uh, n number of atoms in the observable universe. It's just uh, the number of possible permutation, permutations is um, it's, it's way over. Uh, it's over to the power of 100, which is... Uh, 20 magnitudes greater than the number of uh, atoms in the universe. It's ridiculously large. Or in the modern vernacular, it's 511 big. So let's look at a uh, kind of everyday common example or problem of resource allocation. And uh, let's walk through an example to see what we're actually doing. So let's suppose a farmer has 200 acres of land and they need to decide, make a decision on what to plant uh, in their land. And let's say they've got two different types of crops. For lack of imagination, let's say corn and oats. And the market prices look to be that they can make, let's say, Fifty pounds, fifty dollars per acre profit for corn, and let's say twenty-five pounds dollars per acre for oats. However, twist in the tail as there always is. The corn takes two hours of labour per acre to harvest, and the oats takes only one hour per acre to harvest. In this particular example, let's say that the farmer has allocated or only has limited finances to be able to purchase, let's say, 300 hours of labor to do the harvest. So what's his optimal solution given these constraints? So let's do a chart. <coughs> so here we go, create the axes and put in the labels. Then we make note of our constraints. The uh, number of corns is greater or equal to zero. So that represents the x-axis. And obviously we're not concerning ourselves below the x-axis. So the constraint is built into the chart. Same with the number of oats. Anything to the right of the oats axis um, is positive. So we've got those two constraints. Uh, then the other constraint is the corn and oats is less than or equal to 200 but we don't quite know where and we also have the labor constraints that is two times the cost of labor for corn to one lot of cost of labor for oats is less than or equal 300 hours or units so let's mark those up on the chart. So the red line corresponds to the 200 constraint and the green line uh, cons uh, shows the labor constraint. So now we've got this area in here uh, in light green which represents the feasible solution uh, to this problem. So we could go through every point or every pixel or every uh, data point in that shaded region but of course there's an infinite number because we could always you know we're not restricted to say some random point of 50 50 it could be 50 and a half corn to 49 three quarter oats uh, you know so we could consider every uh, fraction of a number and uh, there is a general rule when doing linear programming that the solution to the optimum solution lies on one of the vertices of the shape that forms the shaded region. So we have to consider the four vertices. So let's start with the first one, zero, zero. And we write that down in our table here. So this is the number C, it's the number of corn. O is the number of oats. And unfortunately, O and zero look similar. 
remember we're keeping them different. That's why I've written things in brackets to keep the O's and the zeros distinguishable. So zero zero. Next uh, vertices is uh, zero corn, two hundred oats. The next easy vertices to pick out is one hundred and fifty corn and zero oats. And then the last one, well, you could probably eyeball it off the chart, but, um, you know, let's do it mathematically. But you could eyeball it off the chart. I think you can probably see where it lies. So it's a simultaneous equation. So um, corn plus oats equals 200. Two corn labor plus one oat labor equals 300. Let's solve for C. Uh, so uh, one lot of C plus zero oats uh, equals 100 uh, so therefore 100 plus zero uh, 100 plus oats equals 200 therefore oats also has to equal 100 no great surprise uh, so let's look at our uh, profit table in the first instance zero corn zero oats zero profit and the next instance zero corn 200 oats for the uh, Follow the equation of profit equals uh, 50 times corn plus 25 times oats. We get uh, 200 oats times 25 equals 5,000 as our profit. For the next one we have 150 corn, zero oats. So we have 50 times 150, uh, yielding a $7,500 pound profit, whatever, and then the final row is 100 corn and 100 oats so 50 times 100 plus 25 times 100 also equals 7500 so here actually there's um, two winners so we could have 150 corn or 100 of each and we get the same result so by happy accident um, if we draw in here our profit slope or profit gradient and superimpose that on this chart and we slide it up to the uh, maximum point of the feasibility region we can actually see in fact that the profit slope matches the coincidence of these two points that we've calculated as points of maximum profit which actually means that any point on this slope between these two points will also give uh, maximum profit return so in this instance it's just coincidental we c shouldn't rely on uh, any particular slope meaning the same thing uh, just so happens in this case uh, the profit slope is the slope that is uh, the slope is the same as the slope between the two profit points so moving back to our concrete problem we can actually express the uh, problem network as a linear program solution. However, it gets a little bit more complicated because the number of variables uh, has increased from two to three, which means instead of plotting 2D charts like we've just done, we're going to need to move to three dimensions. So in 3D land, we get three axes, X, Y, and Z. And this is necessitated really when we move from, uh, say, two constraints or actually two different variables of constraints into three variable constraints. So instead of having lines on a 2D plane, we now have planes in 3D space. So in this example, we can have a constraint where the plane of X equals zero or greater and the plane of y, zero or greater. And that provides a feasible or solution space, uh, which would be approximated by a cube uh, represented by x greater than zero, y greater than zero, but we haven't put on any constraints for z, so it could be infinitely tall or uh, actually infinitely negative. So if we had a constraint now that says x plus y plus z equals 8 and we put that plane in and we can see that this third plane now bisects the 
X plane and the Y plane and the Z plane at zero. And what we get is this kind of uh, triangular shape. In fact, that's a bit naughty of me to say that. It's a triangle in 2D space, but in 3D space, it becomes a tetrahedron. After all, it's got four sides, front, back, bottom, slope side, I guess. So things get a little bit more complicated now. But the objective equation can still be represented by a linear program. And at this time, it might be a good thing to point out, Euclid's uh, Geometry. And it's such a wonderful book. It, it's, it just shows how you can start with a basic premise and build on it and build on it and build on it to describe fantastic things. So virtually the first definition uh, in uh, Euclid's Elements book, number one, is a point is that of which there is no part. Brilliant. And a line is a length without breadth. And the extremities of a line are points. A straight line is any one which lies evenly with points on itself. And a surface is that which has length and breadth only. And the extremities of a surface are lines. And a plane surface is any one which lies evenly with the straight lines on itself. So here in this simple diagram we have lines that are extended into planes. The surfaces have length and breadth only, they don't have any thickness. But the extremities of the surfaces are all lines. So to me it's just wonderful how we've gone from a point to a line, from a line to a plane. And how we've defined four planes, the X plane, the Y plane, the Z plane, or the ground. And then the plane where X plus Y plus Z equals, I think I set it to eight, so it should intersect the axes at roughly eight. So these four planes now describe a 3D volume. Uh, here shown in the translucent red. So if we take this three-dimensional object now and reduce the number of dimensions to two, we get a triangle. And if we reduce the number of dimensions to one, we get a line. And if we reduce the number of dimensions to zero, we have this point thing that Euclid described as that which has no part. So we can introduce a bit of terminology here. and uh, The word is simplex. And in geometry, a simplex is a generalization of the notion of a triangle or tetrahedron to an arbitrary number of dimensions. So in zero dimensions, it becomes a point. In one dimensions, it becomes a line. In two dimensions, it becomes a triangle. In three dimensions, it becomes a tetrahedron, like the one shown here. And let's just stop at three dimensions. Yes, they do go higher, but not for now. So much like in our 2D example, we can keep adding planes that represent the constraints and we can keep slicing this uh, 3D volume or this tetrahedron uh, by adding and cutting and slicing according to the uh, constraints of the planes. And then what we'll end up with is a polyhedron, a three-dimensional shape with uh, an specified number of surfaces, which is according to the number of constraints. So the tetrahedron is perhaps the simplest form. But you know, we can have uh, three-dimensional objects or shapes that represent all these constraints uh, with 10, 20, 30, 100 faces. And then the solution to find the maxima or the minima, you know, the minimum cost or the maximum profit in these kinds of uh, problems, is to examine Every vertex, get the coordinates of the vertex and plug it into the equation. Test for maxima or minima. Move on to the next vertex and repeat. And then when we've examined all the vertices, um, we know where our greatest maxima or our lowest minima is. Then we've solved the problem. So really it's just uh, traversing the edges uh, of this object that we've created in this kind of uh, you know, solution space. In the example with the corn and the oats, I used C and O to represent um, values or variance of corn and oats. And in these types of problems, it's convention to replace the 
variables, the decision variables, that is to say, how much corn, how much oats, with uh, X and Y and Z, uh, for example, to represent the kind of different dimensions of the problem. But of course, some of these problems run into thousands of variables and we run out of alphabet pretty quick. Uh, so this is where the nomenclature looks or makes it look complicated because we start introducing fancy names for our decision variables like x1 of 2, xab, and um, use subscripts and superscripts. And that's exactly what we're going to have to do coming up for the next part. So in the simple example of corn and oats, there is really only two options. Do we plant corn or do we plant oats? And how much of each? That is the decision variable. In the concrete problem, we've got uh, which factory should supply which site with how much. So it's quite a bit more complicated. And so we're going to represent these different pathways by using X and subscript IJ, where I is really one, two, three for the different factories and ABC are the three different sites. So X1A simply means supply from factory one to site A and X2C would mean supply from factory two to site C. It's actually a faster way of writing out rather than saying let X equal some amount from factory one to site B and let Y equal from factory one to site B and let Z equal from factory one to site C and A equal from uh, factory two to site A and let B equal from uh, factory two to site B it gets confusing if we write it that way along too many variables to track so all we're really doing is saying let x equal some transportation and let the subscript describe from which factory to which site so if we look back to the farmer example what we were really solving for there is maximum profit given by the formula that profit equals 50 times c plus 25 times o where uh, C is corn and O is oats. And we traced around the feasible solutions looking for the maximum payoff, which is what we sought for, maximum profit. In this example with the concrete, the question is, what is the least cost? So it's going to be the same kind of exercise, but we're looking for the least amount, not the maximum. But we have to write down what's known as the objective function, which in the farmer example was the profit function. Here we're writing down the uh, formula for the cost and our objective function is then the minimized uh, solution of the cost formula. And we know what the costs are per track. So example is X1A. So the cost from moving a particular quantity of concrete from factory one to site A is 4. So the first term is 4x1a and the next one is 3x1b and the next one is 8one c and we can write out the rest of the equation uh, thus. Similarly this one has constraints and we already know what these are. These are the supply and demand constraints and in this example we're assuming um, a, a perfect balance uh, of supply and demand. So uh, A has a demand of 200, B has a demand of 200, C a demand of 300, and factory 1 can supply 300, 2 can supply 300, and plant 3 can supply 100. So we can write those or express that in the following formulas. Then all we have to do is solve those formulas. Easy peasy. Yeah, except not quite. Or we could uh, map that out on a uh, 3D chart, uh, compute all the vertices, and then use the coordinates that we've garnered from the vertices to plug back into the equation and find the minima. Another way 
is to use a generalized algorithm. Uh, I think it's called the stepping stone method. So this is where we find an initial solution and then test for optimality and then refine. So from the chart on the screen, we can see that we need to supply 200 to A, which we fulfill from site one. And site B also requires 200, but we also know that plan A still has 100 available capacity. So we roll that capacity over into supplying the demand for site B. Uh, but site B still requires 200. So where do we get the other 100 from? Well, this is where we now draw down on plant 2. So we allocate 100 capacity from plant 2 to uh, be delivered to site B, therefore fulfilling the 200 demand. And likewise for site C. Uh, we now know that there is a still 200 capacity remaining with plant 2. So we have plant 2 deliver 200 to site C. And site C still has a requirement uh, of an extra 100 to make up a total of 300, which can now be supplied from plant 3. So basically we fill this table from top left to bottom right, allocating uh, as per demand and then rolling down to the next row or the next plant when we've exhausted capacity from the row above. And if we do a quick add up, we can see that this solution is feasible since supply and demands constraints are satisfied. So now the cost is just a matter of reading across the table. So remember X subscript uh, IJ is just the supply from plant to site. So X 1A 200 plus X 1B 100 plus X 2B 100 plus X 2C equals 200 x 3c equals 100 and everything else is null or zeroed so the total cost of the solution multiplying in our cost factor per leg is 4 times 200 plus 3 times 100 plus 5 times 100 plus 9 times 200 plus 5 times 100 equals 3900 dollars pounds yen pesos krugers whatever then you still have those and now we come to testing the solution for optimality so there's an important rule here, and the rule is the number of occupied cells, the roots used, must be equal to one less than the sum of the number of rows and the number of columns. In our example, we have three columns, three rows, three plus three is six, and we just so happen to have one, two, three, four, five roots used. Where the number of occupied cells is less than the sum of columns and rows, the condition is said to be degenerative. We can come on to that when I understand what the fuck that means. Uh, but this was never really meant to be an instruction. It's just something to explain something that I found particularly interesting and uh, inspirational. And it's a real good tool to use for... Uh, making decisions in multivariable instances like these kind of optimization problems. I'm going to go through a couple more examples, uh, but it, you know, it's like calculus, you know, the doing integrations of differentiation. It's, um, also do with change on change and rates of rates of change. And it's a fascinating subject. And it's, wow, it's a huge subject. You know, you can go so, so deep into it. Uh, anyway, this is just for a flavor. So let's carry on with the solution. So we've originally met the, uh, demands of this scenario. Filling in the cells in the table, going from a top left approach to a bottom right. And we can start at different corners. So we can start from the top right, fill into the bottom left, start from the bottom right, fill into the top left, or fill in from the bottom left and fill into the top right. And as each uh, demand is met by a different supply, we can tally up the different cost matrices and then obviously choose the one that's the least cost, which in this instance happens to be the first one. Okay, so that's got us our starting block. Yeah, there are other combinations uh, you can use. You can start in the middle, or if you've got a 5x5, five five, you can start cell 2, row 2, branch out. But 
uh, we can start from any one of the uh, four corners that we've used um, of any which one that is the least cost so far. And then we can run now this optimization process to see if we can actually do better than one of the uh, four corner solutions. <laughs> so here it does get a little bit messy. Okay, so we need to use what's called uh, improvement indices. And so we need to know what the total cost is. And that's going to be due to uh, the cost of all the cells. And we therefore need to keep track of the cost of rows and the cost of columns. And then obviously we need to optimize. So we know that the total cost of all the rows plus the cost of all the columns is going to equal the total cost. And so again, here I've used the same kind of nomenclature to indicate uh, I and J as uh, rows and columns. So expanding that out, um, assuming we've done the uh, four quadrant, four corner uh, calculations, and we're starting with the first one because that's given us the least cost. Uh, if we actually substitute in the uh, values for the equation uh, R plus K equals C and expand it, this is what we find. Uh, R1 plus K1 equals 4, R1 plus K2 equals 3, R2 plus K2 equals 5, R2 plus K3 equals 9, and R3 plus K3 equals 5. Well, that gives us a bunch to sort through and solve, doesn't it? So, um, yeah. So it's normal practice to set R1 equal to 0, and then we can solve from there. So if R1 equals 0, then K1 equals 4. If R1 is 0 plus K2 equals 3, then K2 must be 3. R2 must be 2. K3 must equal 7, therefore. And R3 minus 2. I think that's covered them all. And that yields the following table. And X uh, marks the cell that we've used in our starting solution of the lowest optimized out of the... Um, four corner approaches that we found. And so this table only shows the costs, not the quantities that we're transporting. <laughs> all right, and yeah, about halfway through. Uh, it's all good, it'll come good. All right, so I haven't got that far. Right, we now need to work out if there's any improvement to be had. So for each unused cell, an improvement index, uh, IJ, uh, is given using the following formula. So the index of ij, any particular cell, is the total cost, so the ij, minus uh, the cost of that row index, minus the cost of that column index. And by definition, the improvement index for occupied cells uh, is zero. Uh, and f uh, filling in the blanks then, uh, we end up with the following table. So I'll just flash up the equations. There you go. Satisfy uh, yourself that uh, they all add up. So here's the result. And the algorithm says that if all the improvement indices are greater than or equal to zero, an optimal solution has been reached. Here we are. So confirm this is the optimal solution. If there are any negative improvement indices, then it is possible to improve the current solution and decrease the total shipping costs. Each negative index computed represents the amount by which the total transportation costs could be decreased if one unit were shipped on that route. All that said then, <laughs> the solution to this problem was 200 tonnes from plant 1 to site A, 100 tonnes from plant 1 to site B, 100 tonnes from plant 2 to site B, 200 tonnes from plant 2 to site C, and 100 tonnes from plant 3 to site C. The total of the transportation pattern, which is the minimum total cost, is 3,900, as shown earlier. But wait, there's more. And this is where the beauty of this really comes in. Not only do we have an optimal solution now, but we can see how it reacts to uh, changes in the environment. So let's suppose, uh, due to roadworks or uh, some issue with the particular route taken, the cost of shipping one ton from plant one to site A has now increased six dollars six pounds. Everything else remains the same. Obtain the improvement indices 
using the uh, so-called northwest corner solution uh, to check for optimization. Uh, so here's the adjusted table, uh, changing the cost uh, from uh, 1A from 4 to 6. Our improvement indices equation has now uh, changed uh, where R1 plus K1 formerly equal 4 and now equal 6. Again, taking R1 equal to 0 and solving, we obtain R2 equals 2, R3 equals minus 2, K1 equals 6, K2 equals 3, and K3 equals 7. The improvement indices for the non-occupied cells are thus. And now we have a negative improvement index on I21, which shows that this solution is no longer optimal and can be improved. So remember what we were talking about risk models, uh, hazards, catalysts and events, and setting up the monitoring. So this is where all this comes into play. You know, every week we monitor what's the cost of transportation, uh, what is um, the uh, change in transportation costs. Um, is it exceeding one sigma, two sigma, three sigma? Is it an upward spiral, downward spiral? Um, is it... Um, an abnormality, you know, we've got to constantly monitor the transport costs because it might um, be beneficial to switch routes, uh, but we don't know that unless we monitor. And we also have switching costs as well to bear in mind in kind of the real world, but this is what it all pegs to. So the improvement indices have shown us that cell 2-1 um, is the next preferred supplier because it's the least cost um, of all the remaining pathway routes. And so because we want to increase on this particular cell, the lowest cost one, we've got to take from others. And this is where it all gets fun. How much do we take from whom? Ah, the big questions. So this is where the concept of looping comes in. And basically we walk around a loop. Now a loop can be, uh, you know, down one tile, back one tile, up one tile, and back to the start. Or it can be down one tile, to the right one, down one again, left, left, up, up, right, back to the start. So there are a few rules to loops. You can't do diagonals. You have to do full right angles, which means each pair of consecutive cells lies in either the same row or the same column. So proper right angles. No three consecutive cells lie in the same row or column. So you can only go two at maximum, then you have to turn. The first and last cells of a sequence lie in the same row or column, i.e. again, uh, proper right angles and not to end on a diagonal. And no cells appear more than once in the sequence. So you can have all sorts of fanciful uh, loops on large matrices. Wow, I hear you say, what a load of bullshit. <laughs> what the fuck is all that loops about? Well... Here's what we're actually doing. We're going to tweak this uh, matrix by adding a quantity to one of the roots. And we need to balance this across the whole matrix. So if we add a quantity to a cell, uh, we can balance that by reducing a quantity in an allocated cell in a similar row or in a similar column. But you can appreciate that if we remove a quantity, uh, let's say, for example, in an adjacent allocated cell in the same column, then the incident in which that secondary allocated cell is adjusted now itself needs adjusting across its row. And as we look left and right at that second unallocated cell and make an adjustment there, that now needs its corresponding row adjusting. So you can see how this will trace out uh, a loop. So the loop is a way to ensure that we're balancing all rows and all columns as a consequence of making the original adjustment. That's why we can't have a, an odd number um, like uh, no more than three adjacent cells. That's why it has to uh, land and start on the same cell. Guarantees it's even, which means that the number of uh, additions and offsets uh, to the minor tweaks and adjustments will always balance out if 
uh, as we say, for example, trace around a loop, we add the quantity and then in the next step, we take away the adjustment quality and then in the next um, allocated cell in the loop, we add it back add it back into that allocated cell and then in the next place along the loop, we take it out again. As we trace around all those nodes, which should be allocated cells, uh, we actually end up with a, a net zero gain, but we've shifted the adjustments. So now our matrix were rather limited um, to the root shown. So to cell to one, we had uh, some quantity, um, let's call it theta for lack of a better symbol, but we have to make sure that the matrix remains balanced. So in the next row, we have to minus theta from the amount, but we also have to balance the row as well as the column, which means that in cell 2a, we have to add theta and then to balance the top row and uh, column A, we have to take theta away from 200 in cell 1A. So to optimize, we make theta as large as possible without making any entry negative. So we have to choose theta equal to the minimum of 100, 200 equals 100. Uh, so basically why 100, 200, well, if we go around our four cells that we're concerned with amounts 100 and 200, so the most that we can uh, remove is going to be 200 or 100, and the most we can remove without turning any number negative is 100. So that's the minimum. So taking theta equals 100 gives us a new improved solution. A note that uh, cell 22 is now blank, so root 2b is actually not to be. Ha ha ha, thank you very much. Yeah, and no, I just can't help myself. To be is to do, Socrates. To do is to be, Jean-Paul Sartre. Dooby dooby doo, Frank Sinatra. So let's test for optimality again. So using our R and K values, plopping the X's where they belong on the routes used. Well, we obtain new values for R2 equals 1, R3 equals minus 3, K1 equals 6, K2 equals 3, and K3 equals 8. And like we before, we'll just run that through the uh, improvement indices for the unused cells. Check the results for any negative numbers. They're all non-negative, so this solution is now optimal. 100 tonnes from plant 1 to site A, 200 tonnes from plant 1 to site B, 100 tonnes from plant 2 to site A, 200 tonnes from plant 2 to site C, 100 tonnes from plant 3 to site C. Plugging in the numbers, blah, 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 $4,200 or $4,200 pounds, yen, bat, peso, hamero, lira, potatoes, whatever the fuck. Now there also is uh, another empty cell here at 1.3, which shows us that we could switch routes without changing the total overall cost. So, I don't know, maybe a driver on a particular route, or f for whatever reason, uh, an aesthetic or some incidental may just make one route preferable over another. Uh, again, uh, options. Good to know because sometimes things happen. Anyway, that's just about that. Um, there are a couple of notes. Of course, this is an idealized solution where supply equals demand never happens in the marketplace. Uh, to optimize for situ situations where there's surplus or there's a deficit, uh, we just add extra columns into our matrix and call it dummy. And uh, we put in a uh, transportation cost of zero because they will, of course, be transported. And then we run the optimization rules. Uh, so again, we run the four corner approach, find out which is least, and then we apply the optimization steps, calculate R and K, whittle it down, look for negative values, apply our um, looping rules, adding and subtracting theta appropriately and checking for negative values and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get a positive and that will show that uh, the new route is improved.
or uh, optimal. Um, if total demand exceeds total supply, then again, a dummy source with supplies added to the matrix with a supply equal to total demand minus total supply. Phew, that was a long one. If you made it this far, well, thanks for watching and I uh, hope it was as enjoyable for you as it was for me. I love all this stuff, how it all works out, how you just plug the numbers in and you just grind through it and you get an optimal answer. And just, you know, if, if you think about it, maybe working out this matrix can take a few hours or a couple of days. But if you think about what that can mean across savings in terms of an enterprise, it could be hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds or dollars for a day's work. Uh, yeah, I might talk about an interesting book called Value Pricing, which is all about yield management. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, that was a long one. Enough for today. Hope that was good. All right. I'll catch you on the next one.